Space junk enters Earth's atmosphere almost every day. Specialists from Earth track most of it. Around 400 such incidents happen every year. But not all space debris can be tracked. Some fragments of satellites may fall to the ground. That would give us meteor showers every night. Junk falling from the sky develops huge speed, which implies severe destruction. Fortunately, none of this really happens. Very few people had the chance to observe the falling space debris. There were almost no cases in history when fallen satellites damaged someone else's property. To find out what happens to space objects during the fall, you'd need to understand how they managed to fly around Earth for so long. Imagine you work for the Meteorological Service. Today, you're launching a satellite into Earth's orbit to monitor the climate of the planet. The satellite is installed on a rocket. The rocket takes off and reaches the speed of 25,000 miles per hour. This is faster than the speed of a bullet and the speed of sound. This acceleration is necessary for the satellite to overcome the gravitational attraction of the planet. As soon as the satellite goes into space, into the upper atmosphere, the rocket simply falls off. But it's given the satellite the necessary speed and energy to make its motion possible. This movement is called momentum. The satellite is located at an altitude of thousands of miles from Earth. But still, gravity pulls it down. Momentum and gravitational forces make the satellite fly in a circular trajectory around the planet. This trajectory is called an orbit. At this speed, the satellite could move further into outer space, but the force of gravity pulls it down. Our meteorological satellite is balancing between these two forces, and it's quite difficult to find this balance. The closer the satellite is to the planet, the stronger the effect of gravity. To stay in such an orbit, the satellite must fly very fast. Here's our satellite entering orbit and developing incredibly fast speed. And now you can see one of the reasons for its failure. Thousands of other space objects are flying past the satellite at the same speed. The slightest collision can lead to devastating consequences. Currently, about 500,000 pieces of space junk are flying around Earth. These can be small pieces, the size of a tennis ball, or huge ones, the size of a subway car or a bus. There are also tiny fragments of satellites. If two pieces of spacecraft collide with each other, they fly apart into thousands of small segments. The number of them can reach up to 170 million. The planet's orbit is filled with unnecessary debris rushing at great speed. Most of them are tiny, the size of a grain of sugar, but they are no less destructive than the decommissioned segments of rockets that deliver satellites into orbit. For example, a single drop of paint can damage a spacecraft if it's flying at 30,000 miles per hour. To avoid this, engineers calculate the routes of satellites they launch in advance. They also cover it with a strong protective layer of various metals. The more orbital debris flies around the planet, the more accidents happen. And the more accidents happen, the more orbital junk appears. This is an endless circle. But scientists try to develop strategies to clean up Earth's orbit. The next cause of accidents is the Sun. Our star is constantly releasing high-energy particles. These particles collide with everything that gets in their way. And when they crash into satellites, they can change their trajectory and slow down momentum. There's a shield in the upper layers of the atmosphere, the Earth's magnetic field. Satellites fly inside this shield. The field reflects solar radiation from the planet, but there are places on Earth where this shield is weaker. And when satellites fly past such spots, they receive a large amount of radiation. It disables navigation and the stable operation of all systems. Fortunately, accidents caused by solar radiation are rare. Another reason is the change in the gravitational field of Earth. Our planet is in motion. Its internal processes can change the shape of the gravitational field. These changes can disrupt the satellite's flight path around the orbit. 
Fortunately, such gravity failures are insignificant. They can only cause the satellite to fall after a few years. And the most important reason why satellites fall is people disconnecting them. If a satellite can no longer transmit data or is outdated, specialists simply make it fall. Another common reason is the lack of fuel. If the satellite runs out of it, it's impossible to control it. It turns into a senselessly flying object. That's why experts use the remaining fuel to slow down the satellite and bring it out of orbit. Scientists plan such operations well. They stop the satellite at a certain moment so it can fall over deserted areas of the oceans. The satellite falls and passes through Earth's atmosphere at great speed. The lower layers create strong pressure and friction on space junk. These processes generate a huge amount of heat. The satellite catches fire and falls apart. Most of it simply burns. The remaining debris falls in remote places of the planet. This method works when the satellite is flying close to Earth. Some space objects are located far from the planet. The Earth's magnetic field is much weaker there. In such cases, it's easier to use the remaining fuel to go beyond the gravitational force. They just send a satellite to float into outer space. Pieces of rockets, large metal remnants of old satellites, and other debris can't be controlled. All these pieces fall into the atmosphere of the planet and turn into ash. The smaller the falling object is, the fewer chances it has to reach the ground. Big junk can survive in the atmosphere. Fortunately, such objects are monitored by special services. When an old satellite enters Earth's orbit, people already know in advance where it will land. And if someone is in this territory, they will be evacuated. But this happens quite rarely. People only use a small percentage of the total land area for living. More than 70% of the planet is covered with water. If the atmosphere can't burn space debris, then water will destroy it. Space objects either fall into the ocean or in sparsely populated areas of Earth. The probability of a satellite hitting someone's house is really small. But if that happens, then, according to the law, the house owner will be compensated for the damage. Whatever country you live in, the company that built the fallen satellite will be to blame. This company is obliged to pay all losses. Falling space junk has its favorite location on our planet. This place is even called the Satellite Cemetery. Point Nemo is a conditional spot in the world ocean, the most distance from any land on Earth. It's very difficult to get there, and it's not much easier to get out. If you find yourself in this place, you need to sail more than 1,000 miles to get to the nearest island. Moreover, the distance to the International Space Station from this place is smaller than to the nearest land. If you suddenly find yourself on a ship at Point Nemo and you run out of fuel and don't have a radio, then you need to think about what signal to send to the sky. Astronauts from the ISS may notice you and inform the Coast Guard of your location. Almost no ships sail here. That's why all companies throw their satellites away in this place. The blast wave, the force of the impact from the junk, will dissolve in the boundless ocean. The bottom of this place is covered with space debris. Falling satellites do no harm to sea creatures. Point Nemo is one of the most lifeless places in the world. Cold, nutrient-rich water doesn't get here. There's hardly any wind that's carrying a lot of organic substances through the ocean. In simple words, there's no necessary amount of food for the development of large life forms. Right now, Satellites are falling in Point Nemo and slowly sinking to the seabed. Traveling at about 17,000 miles per hour, 250 miles above the Earth, astronauts watch 16 sunrises and sunsets every day while floating around in a box with a handful of people they depend on for survival. Whether humans should set off to other worlds beyond Earth or not, one of the most compelling drawbacks is this. Our bodies don't like it. Few people know this better than the NASA astronaut who spent nearly a year on the International Space Station from 2015 to 2016, Scott Kelly. Like other astronauts, Mr. Kelly served as a test subject in the study of space travel's effects on the human body. Unlike other astronauts, Mr. Kelly has an identical twin, Mark, 
who is an astronaut himself. This gave researchers an uncommon opportunity to monitor the two brothers as they lived in two very different environments, one on Earth and the other 250 miles above it. When the astronaut went into space and his slightly older twin brother Mark stayed on Earth, the age gap between them increased thanks to his time in orbit. And it's all down to Einstein's theory of relativity. What it suggests is that time moves more slowly for objects in motion than it does for a stationary observer. It also moves more slowly the closer you are to a gravitational mass like Earth. In other words, we're not all experiencing time at the same rate. The faster you move and accelerate, the more time slows down. And because Mr. Kelly has been zooming up to and down from space and orbiting the planet at around 17,500 miles per hour, his brother Mark has lived through 0.005 extra seconds. The brothers were born six seconds apart back in 1964, and now that gap is 6.005 seconds. This warping of time is known as time dilation and the Kelly brothers qualify for both aspects of it. How fast they've been moving in relation to one another and how close they are to a big object, which is Earth. So, depending on our position and speed, time can appear to move faster or slower to us relative to others in a different part of space-time. And for astronauts on the International Space Station, that means they get to age just a tiny bit slower than people on Earth. That doesn't mean you could spend your life in a basement just to outlive the rest of us here on the surface. The effect isn't noticeable on such a small scale. If you became a basement hermit, then across your entire lifetime, you'd only age a fraction of a second slower than everyone else above ground. But your brain might freeze when you think about this. A watch strapped to your ankle will eventually fall behind one strapped to your wrist. Your head technically ages more quickly than your feet. Time passes faster for people living on a mountain than those living at sea level. The classic example for this is the twin scenario. One twin blasts off in a spaceship, traveling close to the speed of light, and the other stays behind on Earth. When the space-traveling twin returns to Earth, she's only aged a couple of years. But she's shocked to find that her Earth-bound sister has aged over a decade. Of course, no one has performed that experiment in real life, but there's evidence that it's real. When scientists launched an atomic clock into orbit and back, while keeping an identical clock here on Earth, it returned running ever so slightly behind the Earth-bound clock. Then time gets even more complicated, because time dilation can happen any time. A good way to think about it is to consider the astronauts living on the International Space Station. They're floating about 260 miles above, where Earth's gravitational pull is weaker than it is at the surface. That means time should speed up for them relative to the people on the ground. But the space station is also whizzing around Earth at about nearly 5 miles per second. That means time should also slow down for the astronauts relative to people on the surface. But the reality is that Mark, the brother who's aged a few milliseconds longer, could end up better off in the long run if Mr. Kelly's extended time in space causes his body to deteriorate faster. Ten science teams in NASA's twin study examined the brothers' astronauts before, during, and after the astronauts' 340 days in space. The teams studied each twin's bodily functions, they ran memory tests, and they examined the men's genes, looking what differences might be due to space travel. They confirmed that lengthy space travel stresses the human body in many ways. Space living can change genes and send the immune system into overdrive. It can dull mind and memory. Most changes that the astronaut experienced in space reversed once he returned to Earth, but not everything. The researchers tested him again after six months back on land. Roughly 91% of the genes that had changed activity in space were now back to normal. The rest stayed in space mode. His immune system, for instance, remained on high alert. DNA repair genes were still overly active and some of his chromosomes were still topsy-turvy. What's more, the astronaut's mental abilities had declined from pre-flight levels. He was slower and less accurate on short-term memory and logic tests. It's unclear whether these results are definitely from spaceflight. That's partly because the observations are from only one person. But one thing is sure, time is relative. Think of it this way. If a clock is stationary and you are traveling at a very high speed, you happen to pass by this clock and have a glimpse at it, you'll see that it's running slowly, or maybe it's completely static. 
This is because the speed at which the mechanical functions of the clock are working slower than you. What you see is the time in the past, while you have already skipped that second and are in the future. During this experiment of high-speed traveling, you haven't aged at all, because all the processes in your body are working at the same speed as you. After a certain age, your body starts to deteriorate, which eventually leads to a state when it stops functioning. This aging phenomenon, especially in humans, is caused by a protein structure in the cells called telomeres. These structures protect our cells from deteriorating, but with each cell replication, these telomeres start to lose strength, which is called telomere length. If the telomere length shortens to a certain extent, the cell becomes vulnerable to diseases. We can say that telomeres are the natural countdown timers in our bodies, which determine when we will expire. The telomere length can be affected by external factors like stress, which accelerates our timer. The twin study experiment by NASA included documenting the changes in telomere length of both brothers. The telomere length of the space brother increased while he was aboard the International Space Station. Before the mission, both brothers had nearly the same telomere lengths, meaning if we ignore issues like mental stress, both brothers should live roughly an equal age. But while the space brother was orbiting the Earth, he had almost 14.5% longer telomere length. The space brother was a few years younger than his ground brother biologically. Because the telomere length of the space brother resumed to normal when he came back to Earth, it took almost 190 days after return for the telomere length to restore to expected. The blood samples from the International Space Station were sent back to Earth for processing. This means the blood wasn't traveling at the speed of the ISS anymore. Also, the space-time paradox states that the space brother should be younger upon return. But the telomere length restored to its original state before the mission. The space brother was again the same age as his ground brother. A lack of gravity is the main cause for these intense changes in aging. Gravity plays an immense role in the majority of our bodily systems. Take the muscles for example. Older people's muscles tend to shrink and decline as they age and become less mobile. Astronauts' muscles react in a similar way because they are barely used. That's why astronauts staying in space for extended periods of time use special exercise machines to help reduce this effect. A similar process takes place in the bones. After a certain age, people on Earth start to lose mass in their bones, typically at a rate of about 1-2% to a year. But in space, those people lose bone mass at a greatly accelerated rate, as much as 1-2% to a month. Because the astronauts' bodies don't need to support their weight, the bones begin to decrease production of new bone material and increase the amount of old bone absorption. Luckily, their skeletal systems usually return to normal once they've spent some time back on our blue planet. If the space brother was shielded from all harms of space, like radiations, while orbiting the ISS, then he would have lived longer than his ground brother. Even though they're saving 0.005 seconds, astronauts still experience some of the symptoms of a drawn-out aging process. So the next time you find yourself wishing the weekend would last longer, stay low to the ground and move really fast. It won't feel like your weekend got any longer, but technically, you may gain a teeny tiny fraction of a second. You won't need to go to space for this little experiment. Picture this. You're an astronaut hurtling through the cosmos in your state-of-the-art spaceship. But suddenly, you notice that you're running out of fuel. What are you going to do? Trapped in the middle of space. It's hardly like there's a floating gas station. The good news is that you're not going to get completely stuck. A spaceship will never actually stop after running out of fuel. All because there's basically no atmosphere in space. That's where the popular phrase, in space, no one can hear you scream, comes from. Sound travels through the vibration of teeny tiny atoms and molecules. In space, where there is no air, there's simply no way for sound to travel. It's the same for our spaceship. Because there's no air, there's also a complete lack of air resistance. Those tiny particles that do exist in space are way too small to reduce the spacecraft's momentum or drag it back. Because of this, most spacecraft actually turn their engines off for the biggest part of their journey. So. Don't believe those movies that show spaceships with their engines on all the time. That's completely inaccurate. Unlike vessels in the water, a ship in space doesn't need constant thrust to keep moving forward. 
Usually, its engine is only fired up for short periods of time. This is not only practical, but also saves money. Fuel is really expensive to transport into space as it's heavy. That's why space probes try to use as little fuel as possible. They need it when they set off from Earth, and then again when they re-enter the atmosphere. It happens when they need to slow down upon their return. While cars and trains have brakes, it's not that simple to bring a spaceship to a screeching halt. The engines are needed to slow the ship down or bring it to a complete stop. This involves strategically firing up impressive thrusters at the front. It creates the needed drag and reduces the spaceship's speed, but this process also requires super high levels of precision. One wrong move and you're toast, literally. Hit the thrusters too fast and the spacecraft will set on fire as you re-enter Earth's atmosphere at thousands of miles per hour. Traveling too slowly can also cause problems because in this case, you might miss our planet's orbit completely and move way past Earth. And most spacecraft don't have enough fuel to try for a second re-entry, so traveling too slowly needs to be avoided at all costs. But back to the issue at hand. This basically means that any vehicle with an empty tank will continue traveling at the same speed across space until it eventually runs into something. There's just no other way for it to stop. Wait, actually, maybe that's not good news. If you get stranded, it's pretty unlikely that your buddies over there at NASA are going to organize a rescue mission. This sounds kind of sad, but it does make sense. By the time they set up a new team and find a ship to come and rescue you, you'll have already traveled so far into space it would take them years to reach you. This would also cost a ridiculous amount of money. NASA spends on average a whopping $152 million to launch a ship into space. That's as much as buying six brand new top-of-the-range Lamborghinis. Even crazier, it costs NASA about $49 billion to develop and launch the first space shuttle. Unfortunately, once you've left Earth's orbit, it's near impossible that you'll make it back without fuel. That's what actually happened to NASA's Dawn spacecraft back in 2018. On a random day, the spaceship ran out of fuel. This left it completely stranded in the middle of space. It stopped transmitting signals to Earth, bringing an end to an 11-year-long mission that set loads of space records. The spacecraft could no longer generate electricity, as it had no fuel to move its solar panels to point them toward the sun. And to this day, the spaceship is still floating somewhere in space in a derelict state. Luckily, Dawn had no astronauts on board. The spacecraft began to orbit the dwarf planet Ceres, which was the object it was originally investigating. For context, an orbit is a curved path around a star, planet, or moon that an object gets stuck in. But wait, NASA are experts in all things relating to spacecraft, so how did they allow a ship to run out of fuel in the first place? It's actually super difficult to accurately measure the amount of fuel you'll need in space. On Earth, gravity keeps all the fuel at the bottom of the tank, and you can use a float sensor to measure how full the tank is. But this is impossible in space due to a lack of gravity that normally weighs the fuel down. Instead, a common approach is to add an air bladder into the fuel tank that's pressurized before launch to push the fuel into lines. The more fuel is used, the more this bladder expands. It takes up more space and keeps the fuel under the right amount of pressure. This pressure is monitored. That's how they can tell how much fuel is left. As you see, it's a lot more complicated than here on Earth. But say there were astronauts aboard a spacecraft that had run out of fuel. How long could they survive? Well, this depends on how much food and water is on board. NASA usually calculates the extra amount of food astronauts need for their trip to avoid adding extra weight to the spacecraft. But the good news is that this food can technically be rationed and its consumption can be spread out. That's because astronaut food comes in special packaging to stop it from going bad. There are no refrigerators aboard spacecraft. The food comes in clear, flexible pouches that can be snipped open with scissors. All the food is pre-cooked and processed, so it doesn't need to be stored in a fridge. The only exceptions are fresh fruit and vegetables. These are the only things that need to be eaten quickly as they will spoil. Today, astronauts also work with nutritionists so they can pick out the foods that they like and will enjoy eating. They can choose from a whole bunch of products, including mushroom soup, macaroni and cheese, chicken, beef, ham, nuts, and even yummy cookies. Shrimp cocktail is apparently a new favorite among astronauts because of how spicy it tastes. Flavored drinks also come in powdered form, just like the Kool-Aid or instant coffee packets you have sitting in your kitchen cupboard. Interestingly, 
Astronauts often report not feeling hungry in space, so it may be easier than you'd think to ration the food. But even if you can make your food last, what about water? Transporting anything into space costs a lot, and water is quite heavy, so it costs even more to transport. For this reason, tanks of water can't be constantly shipped up to space. Instead, astronauts have a really complex water system. It squeezes every last drop of safe and available liquid out of the environment. This involves recycling used water. It means that our buddies in space drink water that's been filtered from old shower water. Their breath, the spaceship's fuel cells, sweat, and so on. But don't worry, such water is safe to drink and it's actually even better than most drinking water that comes out of taps in the US. The water on a spacecraft first goes through a bunch of filters, starting with one that removes particles and debris. Then it passes through multi-filtration beds, containing clever substances that remove impurities. The final stage gets rid of harmful compounds and destroys nasty bacteria and viruses. There are also water reserves in case of emergency. For example, the International Space Station keeps around 530 gallons of water in its reserves, just in case. But what about the air supply? The primary source of oxygen on spacecraft comes from something called water electrolysis. This is an amazing system that uses electricity from the craft's solar panels to split water into hydrogen and oxygen gas. But as we saw with NASA's Dawn, without electricity, it's pretty difficult to aim the solar panels at the sun which means that the oxygen system would likely shut down. There is some oxygen stored in a pressurized storage tank, though. This is a backup supply designed for emergencies, so it's not all bad news.